Socialist History, Mao Zedong. This is the fourth and final installment in a history series which aims to detail the history of socialism. In the last episode, we talked about Vladimir Lenin, the man who created the modern Marxist analyses of capitalism and also its practical application. In this installment, we will be talking about the man who analyzed this practical application and perfected it. From Wikipedia, Mao Zedong was born on December 26, 1893, in Shaoshan village, Yunnan province, China. His father, Mao Yicheng, was a formerly impoverished peasant who had become one of the wealthiest farmers in Shaoshan. Growing up in rural Hunan, Mao described his father as a stern disciplinary who would beat him and his three siblings, the boys Zemen and Zitan, as well as an adopted girl, Zijian. Mao's mother, Wen Komi, was a devout Buddhist who tried to temper her husband's strict attitude. Mao too became a Buddhist, but abandoned this faith in his mid-teenage years. Years later, quote, Mao moved to Beijing where his mentor, Yang Chengzi, had taken a job at Peking University. Yang thought Mao exceptionally intelligent and handsome, securing him a job as an assistant to the university librarian Li Daxiao, who would become an early Chinese communist. Li authored a series of new youth articles on the October Revolution in Russia during which the Communist Bolshevik Party under the leadership of Vladimir Lenin had seized power. Lenin was an advocate of the socio-political theory of Marxism, first developed by the German sociologist Karl Marx and Friedrich Engels, and these articles added Marxism to the doctrines in the Chinese revolutionary movement. Becoming more and more radical, Mao was initially influenced by Peter Kropotkin's anarchism, which was the most prominent radical doctrine of the day. Chinese anarchists such as Che Yanpi, Chancellor of Peking University, called for complete social revolution in social relations, family structure, and women's equality, rather than the simple change in the form of government called for by earlier revolutionaries. He joined Li's study group and developed rapidly towards Marxism during the winter of 1919. Throughout this series, we've seen socialism change and develop as a response to the development of capitalism. Did capitalism change from Lenin's time to Mao's? No. This is why many people don't consider it to be a further development of Marxism. However, we would be blind to believe that socialism can't develop itself further without the need for capitalism to change. Remember, the Second International did not change with the change of capitalism. So just as socialism didn't immediately change with the change of capitalism, it does not necessarily need new developments of capitalism to develop itself further. Mao made numerous analyses and critiques to Soviet socialism. One thing that Mao would do was look at key tenets of the doctrine, which were vital for its success, and emphasize them, teach them, and perfect their usage. One such development made was the use of criticism and self-criticism as a tool instead of it just being something useful on occasion. From quotations, quote, Conscientious practice of self-criticism is still another hallmark distinguishing our party from all other political parties. As we say, dust will accumulate if a room is not cleaned regularly. Our faces will get dirty if they are not washed regularly. Our comrades' minds and our party's work may also collect dust and also need sweeping and washing. The proverb, running water is never stale and, and a door hinge is never worm eaten, means that constant motion prevents the inroads of germs and other organisms. To check up regularly on our work and in the process develop a democratic style of work, to fear neither criticism nor self-criticism, and to apply such good popular Chinese maxims as say all you know and say it without reserve blame not the speaker, but be warned by his words, and correct mistakes if you have committed them, and guard against them if you have not. This is the only effective way to prevent all kinds of political dust and germs from contaminating the minds of our comrades and the body of our party." End quote. Mao emphasized the necessity for constant, repeated criticism and self-criticism. 
criticism of the party, criticism of cultural norms, and even criticism of Marxism itself. It is very apparent that criticism is a necessity that many of our orthodox Marxist-Leninist comrades are lacking, leading to a repeated trend of them following certain reactionary cultural, political, social, or economic tendencies. Example, the CPGBML's hostile stance towards gay people. Mao also perfected our understanding of the mass line from quotations, quote, in all the practical work of our party, all correct leadership is necessarily from the masses to the masses. This means, take the ideas of the masses, scattered and unsystematic ideas, and concentrate them through study, turn them into concentrated and systematic ideas, then go to the masses and propagate and explain these ideas until the masses embrace them as their own. Hold fast to them and translate them into action and test the correctness of these ideas in such action. Then, once again, concentrate ideas from the masses, and once again, go to the masses, so that the ideas are preserved in and carried through, and so on, over and over again, in an endless spiral, with the ideas becoming more correct, more vital, and richer each time. Such is the Marxist theory of knowledge. End quote. In the USSR, practice of the mass line was somewhat sporadic. Stalin used a form of mass line when developing the 1936 Soviet Constitution, but mass line was not a regular practice. Mao posited that the only way to have correct leadership of the masses was to continuously go to the masses themselves for answers. This is letting the people themselves be the leaders and the party merely a guide, such as the correct handling of the vanguard party. The Cultural Revolution was also a huge development made by Chairman Mao. A common belief among Marxist-Leninists is that the base that is the mode of production would just change the superstructure which is culture. This meaning that, once the Socialist Revolution was victorious, the culture of the nation would mold around it and lose its reactionary tendencies. This was only partially correct. While the base influences the superstructure, it is important to remember that the superstructure influences the base as well. What they found was that, through the neglect of certain aspects of their society, parts of the old bourgeois culture had lingered on, which secured the development of domestic reactionaries, a petty bourgeois faction, and legitimized the interests of the ex-bourgeoisie. From the Chinese Communist Party, quote, The representatives of the capitalist class who have infiltrated our party our government, our armed forces, and various cultural groups are actually a batch of counter-revolutionary revisionists. They are Khrushchev types, and they are sleeping right next to us. All levels of party cadre must be especially aware of this point." End quote. It is important to note that there will be more than just one cultural revolution, as certain aspects of the contradiction between new and old must be settled by deposing certain parts of the old entirely by means of cultural revolution. Mao also gave us a universally applicable way by which the proletarian revolution may be carried out. People's War details the use of an armed struggle and a legal struggle against the bourgeois state. It details the way in which we must conduct these struggles. These struggles, as the name suggests, are protracted, drawn out over a long period of time. Protracted People's War was successful in China and Vietnam. Protracted People's War is currently being waged in India, Nepal, the Philippines, Peru, and Turkey. Many people even find evidence of how the Bolshevik Revolution was an instance of People's War. From quotations, Quote, the richest source of power to wage war lies in the masses of the people. And the revolutionary war is a war of the masses. Only mobilizing the masses and relying on them can we wage it. End quote. I would speak more of what it is specifically and exactly, but protracted people's war is one area of Maoism which I myself am not intimately familiar with. Mao also made significant developments 
to how we understand Marxist dialectics. Mao suggested that all movement and life is a result of contradiction. He differentiates between two types of contradiction, antagonistic and non-antagonistic. Mao also shows us that not all contradictions are at the same level, and that all contradictions fall into the category of primary contradictions or secondary contradictions. Mao's writings on contradiction are very dense, far too dense to be put in this video. I would suggest reading On Contradiction for yourself. In conclusion, Mao took Lenin's practical application of Marxism, developed it further, and perfected it. If we are to consider Lenin's analyses of capitalism and furthering of Marxism as a higher stage of Marxism, then we must also consider Mao's analyses of dialectics and furthering of Marxism-Leninism as an even more highly developed stage of Marxism. This is why Maoism is itself a distinct ideology. It represents the latest and possibly the last qualitative leap in the proletarian ideology.